Thanks, Mike. And this is the device here, I think. Well, thank you. And good afternoon. So here we I am you know, between you and uh, the dinner tonight. And I hope to make it quite interesting. Because first of all, let me confess, I'm a technologist. And also, I represent the technology community here. And also, I'm an optimist. So I also represent the optimist I've heard here today, too. And then you can say I'm from the utility industry, so I am a utility technology optimist. And I think there's a lot to be optimistic about today, and maybe you'll understand why when I get through here. So let's get into it. Yes. So first, uh, Marty and I talked about this because you know, some of the captions on though, to introducing the panel today, one of the statements was, is this up here? You know, the power industry does not have a record of backing basic research and federal government support for R&D swings wildly over the years. I'm a contrarian. I say, bosh. No, I think the industry, and I've talked to some of you today about this very issue, is that the industry is making investments in tech, in tech in, not in distant technology, but in basic research itself all over the place. Now, the structure the industry has today actually is not necessarily conducive to them doing scientific type of research because, one, the ratepayers say do they really want to be paying for that kind of risk about what's going to work out and not work out. I heard some of the people here today talk about that very thing. So what they do, I think, is a much more effective way is they use other organizations. Now, the list could go on page after page, so I just kind of pick the top ones that I saw just off the top of my head there. Obviously, EPRI does a lot of the research in this area and so on. So to me, it's like, well, saying that is not completely fair because research is taking place around the utility industry. They just have to do it in a much more effective way than they have to themselves are doing the research. So secondly, so if they're not doing you know, the pure scientific research, then what are they doing? And I submit to you, and I know, and again, this is many of my utility friends I've been in discussions with them, is that they're very good at applying technology to the issues in the industry today, which is in some cases as a result of the research there. And so is that happening? Is it happening around smart grid, around smart metering? Yes. There are many demonstration projects today. And they're all kind of combinations because it does take a partnership. It takes us, the technologies, partnering with the industries. And yes, believe it or not, we partner with each other in order to make this happen too. So it does take a partnership, the government, the policymakers, and all two working together with that. So just kind of a little scene setting here at the very beginning is that research is going on. Obviously, as a technology firm, we're making investments in technology too. So the basic question is to me is what can technology achieve and how can those achievements be best realized? So here's my submit to kind of answer this question. First of all, it's kind of classic in the technology industry, and I'm sure in others too, that first of all, if you want to take care of a problem, is it well defined? And can you measure it? Or can you measure your progress when it's happening? And so you heard Susan earlier talk about demand, peak demand, and the issue around that, and talk about the progress that she's made around peak demand. So we say, obviously, that's one of the issues today. It's well identified. The other is around the environment and CO2. Now, you can't read all of that, and if I knew how to do the pointer here, I'd show you some of the things in there. But we've heard here, too, that there's many ways, many programs it's taking to address the CO2 issue, anywhere, you know, from renewables to uh, uh, doing something about the carbon itself to also uh, putting in uh, energy efficiency demand response and so on there, too. Now, I could go on because there's other things that, frankly, well identify the problem that we're trying to solve today. So the issue doesn't really seem to be there. It really seems to be about, well, how do we go about doing it? Then I think, at least I've gotten out of it today, and I'm trying to remember some of the names here correctly, but uh, Commissioner Spitzer, Representative Gordon, certainly T. Boone Pickens, T. Boone Pickens uh, have all said they believe that the smart grid, sorry, T. Boone, didn't mean it. <laughs> makes me think of a Seinfeld episode. Okay, never mind. Uh, that 
the smart grid seems to be one of the enablers in order to solve the problems every day. Now, granted, uh, I know that there seems to be a lot of uh, maybe a little bit of shifting about exactly what is the definition of the smart grid, but obviously I think, and I've heard it here today, and I heard Susan again, going back to her uh, presentation, say to the smart grid is, is end to end. It's the whole thing out there. It involves smart metering also. So it's like, you know, the smart grid is an end to end uh, capability that the utility industry needs to frankly enable a lot of the things that will happen around uh, renewables, demand response, communications to the uh, end, to the home, to bring about, you know, the user involvement with that too, as well as, you know, doing energy efficiency type programs. Now, one more thing that the smart grid is very much about going out to the end customer, particularly now we're looking more and more at the residential side of the equation. And the reason, and it is all about this, is about empowering the customer. So I've heard things here today about, well, do customers really want to be empowered? I think they probably do. Speaking as myself, I certainly think you know that I want to do that. So to kind of answer that question, we released a survey that we sponsored uh, uh, in a, in a few weeks ago, and we you know, put the results out today. And I thought an interesting statistics came from that survey. 94% of the end consumers that we surveyed are concerned about the cost of their energy. Now, that's pretty much, would you expect of that? Yes. 95% want more information about the way they're using their industry. They want more granular information to do that. The indication is from that and some of the analysis, and then I invite you, you know, one, to read some of the information that was uh, submitted to uh, release today. Or if you like, we can you know, see me afterwards and give me your card. I'd be happy you know, to give you more detailed information concerning this thing. Is that consumers do want to understand their usage better. Now, granted, you know, do they want to sit there and watch some uh, device as it runs throughout the day? No, I don't want to, but I do want the capability of tell me when something needs my attention or let me determine the characteristics about when I want to be informed that something is occurring. So I think there are different ways that you can do that and it certainly can be enabled by technology. Now, so do we have the technology to achieve the solution? And so you heard Charles Phillips this morning, and you've heard a few others since then. And so you've seen this picture before. And the, and the message about this picture is, to me, is that it's not about one killer solution to do this, one killer app to do this. In order to do this correctly and order to fully enable the smart grid in the utility industry, you've got to have multiple applications. As I say up here, you know, you've got to have... Obviously, you know, the interaction with the customer, you've got to be able to you know to manage demand response. You've got to do uh, energy conservation. You've got to do meter data management, which is a play on the smart grid, and so on, too. But a very important element that's often overlooked, and I've heard it mentioned again here today, is interoperability. How do you bring about interoperability? Obviously, you've got to have interoperability among the applications out here, but from grid to grid between other types of technology out there, too. Because what's missing from this picture uh, is some of my uh, colleagues up here. There's obviously, there's got to be communications out to the meter. There's got to be smart meters in place and so on there, too. So you've got to put end-to-end -end the capability to enable all of that. And that's kind of where that middleware type thing there brings about some of that, to help that interoperability with that. I know it's kind of a, a little bit of a degrading to call this to some of us technologies, but it's the plumbing. You've got to have the plumbing in place to do that, too. Then lastly, obviously, is uh, you've got to manage all this because of the wealth of the data that's got to be managed, analyzed, and so on in order to, you know, to make sense of all this and to keep everything, <coughs> excuse me, in balance. So, smart metering, and the first thing is about smart metering, and our estimation and others is that smart metering really is a subset of the smart grid. 
And so you see there are some of the same types of technologies. Again, it takes multiple technologies in order to do that. Now, I, the point here I think that I would like to make about this is, the takeaway is that this technology is here now. And I don't think it's something we're having to wait on. And if you look at it, and I think some of my other colleagues up here have verified that, that we're actually ready today in order to bring about some of the solutions today. Now, granted, will it be better tomorrow? Yes. Will it be better than that the day after tomorrow? Yes. It will be continually improving with that. But you could say that this is shovel-ready solution today to bring about the enabling smart grid. Now, the last part of this equation is, well, we know what the problem is. We have the vision of how to solve it. We know there's technology available today in order to do it. Granted, it's continuing to get better. All the uh, pilots and so on are proving it out today. But is it justified? Now, I can't address the issue that was brought up earlier today is that, well, what's the effect on the end consumer? All I can point to is, and no, these are not my cases, I did not make any of this, this, this up, this is not studies we've done. I just picked a couple that have been done by, well, in this case, San Diego Gas and Electric. Is that the one to San Diego? Yes, that's the San Diego example. And they've clearly showed that it was justified in order to put their smart grid in place, and I think this was filed before their commission. They're not the only one. I mean, this is much public available information that you go out to multiple websites, as I did, and look over and over again about how this has been justified. Now, what I don't know is, well, what's the impact to the customer rates? But long term, long term, if we don't do this, then what's going to be the impact? I think that's what's going to be answered also. Now, there's, of course, a longer term study here, too, if you want one more. It's obviously what EPRIS has done. And they took a longer term view of this. And again, you know, look, overall ratio of what the payback is with this too. So I think now we've covered all the points. You know, is the technology here? Can we start applying it today? My answer being the technology optimist. And maybe you would say, well, maybe I'm not particularly unbiased in this equation. But I think, you know, there is good evidence out there that it is. Now, there's one more part. Uh, are there going to be skeptics about this? And so in the energy industry, I purposely did not pick anyone current from this. I did not want to embarrass anybody in the room about you know, making statements about the utility industry. But there have been past statements made about the utility industry that granted some of the people wish they probably never made because in hindsight, you know, in the rearview mirror, it turned out to be, well, maybe uh, we would be too limited in our thinking. Now, unfortunately, it doesn't stop there that we in the tech community have our own, too, that occasionally there are some comments made about technology in the industry, too, about the limitations of technology. And I think, you know, that uh, these gentlemen would probably have the same opinion about looking back, is this really, you know, did I make the right statement about the limitation of the industry I'm in? So you see now, I'm the optimist about this. I don't think we've anywhere need, reached the near the end of what technology can do. If it's the one thing I think you can count on today, is it going to be better tomorrow? Is it going to be cheaper tomorrow? Is it going to be less complex to use tomorrow? Yes, yes, yes. So, what's our legacy? So what kind of quote do we want to be remembered for? So I say, okay, well, by looking seven years from now, and we look back and say, well, as a result of some of these meetings that we've been in just today, and some of the things we've heard, what kind of statements do we want to make coming out of here? And I say, well, maybe this is one that we want to make, that we do come together, us with our colleagues here, our technology colleagues, partnering with, you know, the policymakers and the utilities, and this thing can be solved. Thank you.